Greetings everyone, and welcome to LEGO Rewind, where we're trying something a little different today. Since before the end of the show proper, I've wanted to do annual year in review specials similar to the end of season recaps. This one's a little late, you know, last year was uh, something else. But good news, Koppa didn't kill the conversation. The comments are still there. Huzzah! I did all that belly aching for nothing. In all seriousness, I can't tell you how happy I am that all throughout 2020, people were able to share their stories, fun memories of late loved ones, or childhood moments they'd forgotten, or just piece things together that they wouldn't have without the show. My favorites are ones where people wonder if they're going crazy just imagining certain pieces, minifigs, or themes. Trust me, I've been there. The fact that people are still commenting and reminiscing over a year after the show's end just makes it all the more worthwhile. And for all of 2020's lows, it gave me some things to talk about. I won't touch on current developments much, like the fan vote that's happening now. I'll save those for other videos or a 2021 interview. So, for starters, in no particular order, 2020 was a great year for giant brick-built skulls. We're lucky to see one every few years, but we got a couple with good variety this time. This Ninjago one's all cracked and spiky, while this pirate one's more sullen. I can't decide which is more evil, they're both awesome. And the love for giant skulls doesn't stop there, with this mech from this year having a skull for a torso, like a gunman and Gurren Lagan. 2020 was also a good year for pirates, as Barracuda Bay continued the story of Redbeard and friends while basically being two sets in one, along with a more affordable creator pirate ship that's a three in one. Jeez, even the sail is a brick built skull in it. Keep him coming. Mindstorms returns, or rather, it never left us. I thought it was set to be replaced by Boost, but this was a good year to be wrong. I think it's fitting that the main accent color is teal, considering that was out for some time too. Heck, Lego's been pumping out so much teal lately, it's like they're making up for lost time. It's great. I figured schools were still using the last version from 2013, but I've heard from some viewers that theirs still use a 2009 version. Dang, that's some staying power. I bet somewhere there's still a school with a 2006 one. Probably lost most of the pieces by now. So yeah, Mindstorms is here to stay. A robot work is never done. Speed champions increase their standard base from 6 to 8 studs wide. That's a bigger change than it sounds, creating room for loads more detail and accuracy. The 6 wide ones are already getting really good. I just don't think they could improve much more within that limitation. They were gonna hit the ceiling sooner or later. These are a whole different level. Sleeker proportions, sharper lines, better everything. Still, I'm glad they didn't start out this big. The smaller cars and early waves necessitated the creation of many new elements that we just take for granted lately. And if those cars had started out this big, we may not see as many of the fine corners and wedges we enjoy today. And now that they can squeeze even more in there, these cars are sharper than ever. Just immaculate. Good lord. I need to move on before I gush out my spleen. After 41 years, the original Scala was reincarnated as Dots. It's literally the same thing, but definitely a step up from Clickets, and we're getting loads of welcome recolors out of it. I just think they're neat. Took a little longer than I'd expected, but we finally saw some new underwater sets, and they're pretty slick. Probably the closest you'll get to LEGO Subnautica. My kid self would have gone nuts over these. I can only wonder how nice they'd all look together, if anyone has a picture. I think I like these more than most people do, but I'll save my full thoughts for another time. 501st Battle Pack. Not touching that one. <laughs> Let's switch to something less- uh, great. This debacle brought out the worst in people. Since the dawn of the brick, LEGO's committed to not selling war toys, even making their original castle yellow instead of grey so kids wouldn't build tanks. Since then, they've moved the goalposts a little. Star Wars is fine because it's not real. Models like the Red Baron are more for historical purposes, and even Indiana Jones vehicles are really toned down. There's no swastikas on them, and anything resembling more modern military vehicles in their creator line are stylized enough to get away with saying it's not the real thing. Then, they did the V-22 Osprey, exclusively a military vehicle. By the time this was pointed out, the thing was so far in development they tried covering it up somewhat with search and rescue stickers to pass it off as something else, and it being a Technic vehicle more aimed at adults made things a little grey. Not literally. Like if this was a brick-based speed champion's Humvee, you better be pulled much earlier in development. And in the end, this was cancelled. Hypocritical as it may seem, given how much actual fighting there is in LEGO sets nowadays, it is fantasy violence at the end of the day, and the brand is still known as the Toy for Peace. That was a big part of their success following World War II, as Germans stopped buying other brands' more patriotic toys in favor of LEGO Murstein, predating their release in English-speaking countries like America by a decade. 
LEGO does have an image to maintain, as much as it's changed over the years, and this specific Osprey did cross a line. That's not the only reason it was cancelled though. The models suffer serious quality control problems. The main gimmick breaks the teeth on those little gears. It puts strain on other pieces and requires extensive disassembly to replace broken parts. It's a toy that kills itself, and somehow everyone missed this in development. Sets have to be approved like 15 different ways, they get cancelled all the time. They cancelled an actual gun just as they were transitioning to bricks, and not because of some outcry from outside the company, yet this thing made it through every single stage, tripping just before the finish line. It's an embarrassment that it even got that far. And to my fellow Americans who may wonder why LEGO doesn't just make tanks and whatever to support our troops, it's the same reason they don't offer a veteran's discount, which my retail friends get asked about all the time. LEGO's a Danish company, not an American one. They're not us. Of course they don't want to support our military, that's just the world. Oh well, let's move on. Ah, Hinside, we hardly knew ye. Like power miners in Atlantis before it, Hinside ended just three waves in. Similarly to those other themes, the last wave was mostly something different, with new ghostly entities, some different colors, and the closest we will ever come to an authentic LEGO Slenderman. Part of me is sad to see it go, but honestly, I kind of want more themes like this that don't overstay their welcome and manage to go out on a high note. Themes like Ninjago that go on forever just choke out other lines, or absorb them, and I want more variety. At least we got 20 sets out of it inside, that's a lot. And if you want more, well it's pretty easy to slap some eyes, claws, and teeth on a seemingly normal builds from other lines like this one. I got big maximum overdrive vibes as soon as I saw it. Now that it's retired though, you know what that means. Yep, LEGO Rewind's getting a hidden side episode. Eventually. I'll make it the first episode of season 4 in a decade or so. Because of that, I don't want to say too much about it here. I want to save my full thoughts for that script so I'm not repeating myself in 10 years. But I will say, I think the app hurt the theme more than it helped. In other LEGO lines that feature an app, the builds take center stage. Alter Agents, Nexo Knights, the app's just a side thing, a peripheral. In this case, the app is front and center. They want it to be the first thing you think about when you see Hidden Side. The box art is cluttered and murky, confusing people with elements that aren't a part of the physical set, blending together from a distance. It is so important that your product be distinct, recognizable, super easy to spot on store shelves, and normally LEGO's really good about that, but all of Hidden Side's marketing was around the app. And here's the bit LEGO can't seem to understand. Guardians don't like toys that are also apps. I've heard so many stories from retail workers that go just like this. So what is it? Is it a set? Is it a game? Oh, it's both. You build it and use the app. What? My kids are on their phones too much as is. I don't need LEGO keeping them glued to their screens even longer. I demand to speak to the manager. In this modern era, the average normie sees LEGO as an alternative to smart devices, bricks an alternative to looking at screens all the time, and I wish LEGO would lean into that, because when you tell people that as soon as you finish building, you better download the app, it's, it's like, well, why did I spend $80 to play this app when I could have just had any other old app for free? Something like Mindstorms, you can at least get away with saying it's a project, you know, the kids using their brains, but this is just tapping and shooting and occasionally turning a knob, and I just don't think the app is integrated with the set effectively enough to build the whole line around it. It's a distraction that muddies an otherwise perfectly legitimate LEGO theme. The builds themselves are pretty stellar most of the time, and if they just focused on that like normal, Hidden Side probably would have shined more. But I'll have more to say in Season 4. Another theme that's also an app but I think handles it much better? Mario! I gotta be careful about what I show here. Don't want the angry gods in Nintendo to strike me down. This one I actually like. Inside's app featured a little interaction with the sets, but this is all about the landscape. Mario reacting every step with joy or terror to the worlds you create. It's a pretty simple system, you know, just combining modules together, but that's the sort of play I want to see more of, the kind we saw in lines like Life on Mars. My favorite aspect is the brick-built enemies. The whole cube style works surprisingly well, and most of these are really spot on. I also appreciate the blind bags coming with an extra bit of terrain with nice background details worked in, fleshing out your levels that much more. It's the kind of system that, no matter what you get, adds value to the sets you already have. They want you to mix these together, but between these first two waves, the starter course, the adventure set, the blind bags, there's just enough of each Mario trope here that you could dedicate an entire shelf to just a desert level, or a lava level, or grassland, or water, or jungle. Maybe they'll find a way to work in ice levels. 
I get that people expected a more traditional, minifig-focused Mario, but the only thing that annoys me about this big rectangular jump man is he have to turn his back on you to display him or he looks dead. I almost got some of these. For a couple days there, I was this close to giving in, but I decided I didn't want a bunch of loose 2x8 plates laying around. It would be nice if they released Mario by himself someday, like 30 of those 60 bucks are just a man himself. I have no idea how long a line like this can last when they've already covered so much, but hopefully we at least get Ouija before it's over. Also, the instructions are digital download only, so... That's a little annoying, but I guess it's the future. Save the best for last. Monkey Kid, my favorite new line. Why, yes, I do have the second wave. Yes, I would like to make mega reviews of the second and third waves before the year is over, but I don't have a studio to film in. Hopefully, I will over the summer. I said a lot about this line already in my last video. Eight months ago? How ambitious it is of LEGO to craft a Journey to the West sequel? How annoying it is that people want to force some kind of war between this and Ninjago, let alone how many people apparently think it is Ninjago? I've covered this set, so I'll focus more on the show today. I think it turned out pretty good. See, my initial worry was that the special would tell the entire story. Then we'd have a whole season of nothing, and then a finale that just repeats the beginning. You know, the exact thing that happened to Chima. But most of the episodes, while fillerish, actually work for a series like this. Most of the journey to the West is filler. The gang goes to a village, encounters demons, mischief ensues, un with the next distraction. That's what was great about it, was just seeing characters' responses to these roadblocks change over time. The show isn't exactly my type of humor, but it's not far off from the novel's tone, and the later episodes start dropping all sorts of references to the lore that I appreciate. They even start calling the Monkey King Sun Wukong in the English dub, which totally doesn't make sense but gives me chills every time I hear it. The macaque episode is by far my favorite. I'd love to see modern interpretations of other characters from this expanded mythos, like Neja. I like that Wukong is a little out of practice, and they avoid the problems of power creep in a pretty clever way. When the kid punched a hole through the planet, nudged the entire solar system in the first hour, I got Dragon Ball flashbacks to an old man blowing up the moon very early in the story, to stop a monkey no less, and we're supposed to be impressed every time a bad guy glasses a city or levels a mountain after that. In this show, they justify the next several battles being smaller by nerfing the kid a bit, so he can get a better handle of these sudden godlike abilities he has no experience with. Baby steps. That makes sense. I love the art style, how they've made minifigs so lifelike and flowy and stretchy without it feeling uncanny. Though I think it's really funny that it's caught on with so many people that some find themselves asking serious questions about their feelings towards Lego women. People love the animation, which... Yeah, it's pretty great. But I'm also impressed by the sound design. It really adds to the action and gives the show its own feel. I've never heard anything like it. To top it all, they got Sean Shemmel to voice Wukong. That is beautiful. You have to understand, as much as I love Dragon Ball, it is tragic how much it's overshadowed the journey in large chunks of the world. Everyone in the West knows Son Goku, but not that many people know Son Wukong, even though they're essentially the same character. So hearing that voice come out of Wukong, it felt like Dragon Ball giving something back to the story it drew so much from, you know? I caught feelings. If you want my full thoughts on the sets, how expensive they are or whatever, you can watch my last video or the later mega reviews when those are out. So that's about everything I have to say about LEGO in 2020, but not in totality. I... uh... I'm thinking of redoing a couple LEGO Rewind episodes. Not a lot, just a couple. Like, okay, take a look at the Life on Mars slash Mars mission one. I am not proud of that episode. I was still discovering the show's format, I'd barely covered any themes, and in trying to start a broader conversation about LEGO's repetition and endless combat, I singled out Mars Mission as the epitome of those things. And it really didn't deserve that. There is so much more I could think of to say about Mars Mission now, from observations of aesthetic choices to bits of lore and theming, that I didn't in August 2017. It's a sort of theme that, had it been a later season, or even just a later episode, I would give it a fairer shake, like I did with Jack Stone. I even got another copy of that set I returned way back, and yeah, I like it more now. See, Ice Planet may have worse audio than later LEGO Rewind episodes, less professional editing, dry commentary still to delivery, but that's just part of its charm now, because the message still rings true. So it holds up. It'll probably hold up forever. 
I think most of these will. Like, I I'm not gonna redo the Explorians or Dinosaurs episode where I made little foibles later addressed in seasonal recaps, but compared to Ice Planet, Mars Missions episode doesn't hold up. Similarly, there's a lot I glossed over or left out in AquaZone, still one of the better episodes that I wish I knew at the time, and it's too much insight to jot down as cliff notes here in this video script. I could write a follow-up, a sort of AquaZone Part 2, but if I'm going that far, I may as well just do it over. Make it one concise thing. That's why I barely talked about the new underwater sets in this video. I'm saving my full thoughts for an AquaZone redo. I even think Rock Raiders slash Power Miners could be done very differently today. That's another example of me still fumbling a bit because I hadn't quite established Rewind's formula. I didn't know where I was going. And what if I made another Technic episode that was actually about Technic generally, not just the construction side of it? I don't know, I I'd have to stop. Like, I, I just, I can't remake the entire series. I can't go through it all over again, obsessed over constantly correcting myself. The Bionicle episode is riddled with editing and scripting hiccups that bug me, like saying geological instead of geographical, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, so let's say I actually do this, remake a few rewinds. Where do I put them? I mentioned starting season 4 with Inside, and I assume Monkey Kid will wrap up by then, so that's an episode, but that still means I need to wait for at least 10 other themes to come and go in that time to fill out 12 episodes, leaving out the seasonal recap of course. And maybe we'll see that many new themes in the years to come, but I'm not betting on it. So do I make a shorter season? Like 10 episodes? Do I pad it out with themes I just wasn't interested in covering before? A Batman episode? Or Lord of the Rings? Or Town? Or do I wait until then to remake these episodes, put them in that season? Either way, someone's gonna get upset and call me a hack. There's just no winning here. I also don't want the current, inferior versions of these episodes to be the default ones for so long, so I'm leaning on getting them out this year. But I am curious, what would you rather see? Whenever I do it, I have to make more videos. These last 8 months are the longest my channel's ever gone without something. I had so many plans for 2020 that fell through. The Planet Ripple Files, a series showcasing my revamps and mocks, story analyses, more infamous Spider-Man, a video about train marks. But a bunch of things happened. I moved. Left those shelves behind. All the sets you saw in the background are still in totes. I've been working non-stop on my latest book for months because I got a late start and I didn't want to postpone the release much. It was a busy year. That's why I put out the Monkey Kid Mega Review when I did. I knew it could be my last big video for a while. I just didn't realize I wouldn't make any smaller videos either. But smaller videos may have to do most of the time. That second infamous Spider-Man video took almost a month to produce, and that's working on it every day. Monkey Kid? An entire month. That's not sustainable. I can't regularly churn out videos that require that much time in editing. I won't have time left to work on anything else. So I guess that's another reason I'm thinking of remaking a few shorter rewinds while I get a new grip on things. Whatever I do next, I'll try not to make you wait too long, and I hope you'll stick around. Thank you for supporting me through all these long months. I didn't reach 50,000 subs at the end of the year like I'd hoped to at the beginning, but we're further along than I deserve. I'll try to make this year much better. If you want to support my other work, please consider my graphic novels series Planet Ripple. Volume 6 comes out in just a couple months, and it's my best work to date. A season 1 finale, if you will. You can buy the books on Amazon, or read an early draft of the first book for free. And for my fellow Bio fans, there's the Toa, my reimagining of Bionicle which I finished a few months ago, and I'm so happy to finally share the completed thing. In the coming months, I'll reboot Nova Orbis in a new streamlined format. See you next time, though hopefully not too long from now. Toodles! ポリシーション了解。もう次、逃がそう。よし、ついた。へい。やったぞ。へへへ。あれだ。レジャーボート